Hello and welcome to Rage Against the Dark Arts. My name is Miriam Francis and today we are going to be focusing on a article that has just come out from the Daily Beast in regards to Emily Armstrong. Emily and I were both born into the child labor system which was created by Hubbard and was owned and managed and operated by Scientology. This child labor system created by Hubbard was operated in all parts of the world, including Sydney, Australia. The daughter of the president of the Church of Scientology in Australia is speaking out for the first time about past treatment of children within the church. In an exclusive interview with Late Line, Scarlett Hanna has described Scientology as a toxic organisation and says that many of those who've grown up in the church are damaged. Scarlett Hanna talks of children being deprived of contact with parents and communal living conditions where 25 children lived in one unit. Steve Kinane reports. Scarlett Hanna was born into Scientology's elite. Her mother, Vicky Dunstan, is the president of the church in Australia. Her father, Mark Hanna, is a former director of public affairs. As members of the Sea Org, Scientology's elite unit, they sign billion-year contracts dedicating themselves to the cause. But according to Scarlett Hanna, this kind of dedication came at a cost to the children of the Sea Org, who grew up in what was known as the Cadet Org. The best way I can describe it is cattle. Um, we were property of the organisation, um, although they would like to say that we weren't, we were. Children of Sea Org members rarely had contact with their parents. Scarlett Hanna says they lived in separate homes and were granted only 20 minutes each night with their parents. I can't describe it. It was just an incredibly lonely childhood. Um, I had no one to talk to or to look after me or to ask me how I was after school or you know, any of those things that most of us take for granted. Cadet Org members lived in townhouses like this one. It's probably one of the most overcrowded buildings that we lived in. There's probably up to about 25 kids in this particular unit. Being looked after by one nanny? One nanny. But... Scarlett Hanna says children growing up in the Cadet Org in Australia did not receive adequate food or medical care. She says community services visited on two occasions but were deceived by the church. The furniture was dismantled by um, a division within the sea organisation that deals with, um, with labour. And the kids were sent out for the day um, to as appear that you know, they were living to, according to crowding laws. Hubbard described the children of the sea organisation as assets and that they should be trained and used as such. We were not children who were allowed to discover or understand our own identities. We were cut off from our culture, our heritage, our countries of birth. In a lot of cases, we were brought in from other countries around the world, such as is the case with myself and my two brothers, as well as many of the kids. We were limited in our contact with the outside world as well as with relatives. So we did not grow up in the traditional family settings or having relationships with you know, aunts, uncles, cousins, and that sort of thing. We were denied a fundamental education and we were limited to just basic literacy. So we were taught how to read, write, and some basic math. And that was the limit of our education. The stated purpose of these child labor camps was to prepare us for the sea organization. It involved indoctrination on Hubbard's teachings and those things shaped the way that we understood ourselves and understood each other. They shaped the way that we would function in the limiting and inhibiting of our own emotions and ability to react to things around us. These child labor systems, which many of us were placed into as babies or through early childhood, raised us to believe that our only value was to contribute labor towards the organization. Many of us did not have access to the correct information about our own identities, including our full names and date of birth. We were deprived and neglected and had limited contact with our parents who were busy working in the C organization. 
We were not encouraged or supported to pursue our own interests. We were told that our only purpose was to become Sea Org members. For many of us placed there as babies or in early childhood, this level of neglect and abuse was normal. We were desensitized to it, we were conditioned to it, and we did not know that we could ask questions. In fact, we could be punished for criticism of the organization or of Hubbard. If we said that we wanted to leave, we were separated from the group, from our friends, and isolated, and then we were put through punishment programs. We were made to believe that Scientology and Hubbard's teachings were the only way to save mankind and ourselves, and that our sole purpose in life was to join the Sea Organization. One of the things that has been raised in this new article about Emily Armstrong is the status of being cadet. Hubbard described that once you obtained this status of cadet, you were no longer a child, even though he also described that a cadet could be as young as six years old. Once you are a cadet, you hold an official position and in fact, the cadets at the ranch that Emily was at were paid $15 a week. Their pay was being recorded against their social security. Now, I know that because while I was in the, quote, cadet org at the ranch from 1996 to 1998, while my friends were able to get paid $15 a week um, by the Sea Org for their roles in the cadet org, I did not get paid because I did not have a green card for the US because I'd come from Australia and it wasn't legal for me to be in the country. So I could not get a social security and I could not get paid. So during that time, uh, while my other friends were able to, you know, buy things from the canteen with their $15 paycheck, um, I was not able to do that. That's an important thing to note because that means that there are social security records of children which would show their date of birth and show that they were working and being paid for labor during that time period. The positions that were held by the children at the ranch range from working in the galley, preparing food, cleaning up the pots and dishes, cleaning up the galley, cleaning up the dining room, um, doing all the laundry for all of the children, doing the grounds maintenance, including doing the fire breaks, clearing the weeds away um, in the peak times in preparation for a potential bushfires. The Cadet Org had an organization board which showed all of the ranks and positions of the children in the organization, and this also included command lines. You would have to write to um, the kids that were in senior positions to you to ask for time off if you wanted to go and spend time with your parents. We had a rewards and penalties system. The reward included that each week there was an opportunity to be able to watch a movie as a group in one of the course rooms. So there would be a TV set up and one movie would get played, um, but you were only allowed to be in that room to watch that movie if your production was up over the previous week. Many times my production was not up and so I did not get to go and watch the movie and the other reward was that there was a bus trip usually on i think it was a sunday morning that would take the kids to walmart for a couple hours to you know spend their pay as well so some of the punishments included making amends by um, doing additional labors and uh, other things that were quite invasive was the requirement to write up our overts and withholds. So that is to say we would have to sit down and write up all the bad things that we did or all the bad things that we didn't tell anybody that we did. We had to hold the cans on the e-meter and they would check if our needle was dirty. So if the needle had an indication that we were withholding something that we did bad, we would have to go and write up our overts and withholds. And they would then keep those 
write-ups on record and if we did something terribly bad then they would have to punish us for that. One punishment program that they did have there was called the Ethics and Correction Group, or for short, it was called the ECG. And when that was formed, I was placed on that because I had like fooled around with a couple of the older boys there, which was just some like surface touching of each other over the clothes. Um, and that, and that I had done when I was 13. And so uh, that was found out about because they made us all write up our overts and withholds. And um, that was the information that I had included in there. And then they placed me on this thing called the Ethics and Correction Group. That was modeled off of the adult RPF. So this was essentially a child's RPF. And that included that we had to run everywhere we went. We were not allowed to talk to anybody else at the ranch, none of our friends. Um, we, so we were isolated. We were then made to do um, extensive labor to make up the damage for what we'd done and a whole bunch of other steps that we had to make our way through before we could be accepted back into the group. I remember that this caused me a considerable amount of shame for things of a uh, uh, sexual nature which were consensual. Okay, so I've explained all that just to give you a general and factual overview of what the cadet org was without going off into too much detail. But even at that surface level view, you can already see an indication that there was extensive child labor law violation as well as extensive human rights violations. It really was an institution for systemized abuse of children for the purpose of labor for the C organization. It was the desensitizing of children towards abuse and restricting the formation of a child's own identity, including restricting their emotions and inhibiting the way that they were able to feel or speak about things. So Scientology and the Sea Organization were in violation of child labor laws and Emily Armstrong is aware of that. She experienced it. She was there. So in 1998, I was taken from the ranch where I was with Emily and placed into the C organization in Los Angeles at the Blue Buildings. From 1998 into 2000 was a time period when they were really taking a lot of these children from the ranch and placing them into the Sea Org. And these kids were as young as 11 years old at that time. The year 2000, I believe, is around the time when the ranch was um, sort of officially decommissioned. Emily Armstrong, although I don't believe she joined the Sea Organization herself, witnessed a whole bunch of her friends being placed into the Sea Org. I'm not sure exactly what happened to her at that stage, and I'm not sure where she was placed after that. So whatever arrangement that they made for her, um, they did. But, um, but yeah, certainly I wasn't aware that I could say no, I don't want to do this. And many of us didn't understand that we had that option. Emily Armstrong is aware of what happened to the kids. I think that there is a duty to speak on the things that have affected hundreds and hundreds of kids that she experienced as well and that she saw herself. I think that if you have the ability to stand on a stage and scream into a microphone in front of millions of people around the world, I think that, yeah, I think there is a responsibility on you to speak on these things. And I think this is a very, very important conversation to have. Okay, so this appeared in the Daily Beast. The title is New Lincoln Park Singer's Secret Life as Hardcore Scientologist Revealed. Growing up Sea Org, the Daily Beast obtained internal records from Scientology, the FBI, and former Scientologists that shed light on Armstrong and her family's ties to the controversial organization. It was written by Sean Craig, and it was published November 15th, 2024, updated November 16th, 2024. Okay. So here's a photo of Emily Armstrong. Rock band Linkin Park's new lead singer grew up in Scientology dorms for its most zealous followers' children before becoming a hardcore church member, the Daily Beast has learned. Emily Armstrong was unveiled by Linkin Park as its new front woman in September after lead singer Chester Bennington died in 2017. Their first album featuring Armstrong was released Friday. 
Armstrong's history as a Scientologist has already proved controversial. Bennington's son, Jamie, slammed Linkin Park for embracing a Scientologist when she was announced, writing on Instagram that the band erased my father's life and legacy in real time. Okay, so this is from Chester Bennington's son. Now documents obtained by the Daily Beast reveal how Armstrong grew up in the Cadet Org, a church-run order for children of Sea Org members, and how her mother, Gail, has been deeply involved in Scientology, working in its intelligence unit and attacking one of its highest profile whistleblowers. Gail Armstrong also wrote speeches for Scientology leaders and edited an in-house publication that claimed Osama bin Laden was duped into committing the 9-11 attacks by unknown psychiatric methods and which blamed the Columbine High School Massacre on antidepressants. Her daughter was also accused of being part of a group that attempted to intimidate a victim of Scientologist child star turned rapist Danny Masterson. The release of a new album and plans for a 50-date world tour by one of the top-selling bands of all time make the 38-year-old one of the controversial religion's biggest stars when its traditional roster of big names, including John Travolta and Tom Cruise, has long been unchanged. The endorsements of headline talent like Travolta and Cruise, who joined Scientology when they were emerging superstars, brought glitz and appeal to the organization that no amount of money could buy. A confidential 2004 memo describes the outsized importance of famous members to Scientology's success and growth, saying a great deal of positive media comes from actions done by celebrities, but Armstrong didn't require any recruiting effort. She is a celebrity success story raised inside the church. Okay, so this is an OSA Int eval order 90, and it's basically in regards to the PR that Scientology can benefit from, from celebrities. Now, the Daily Beast had pieced together just how deeply enmeshed she and her family are in the Church of Scientology, which said that our reporting about her history had the reek of religious intolerance and ignorance. Childhood in a cockroach-infested dorm. By the time she was of elementary school age in the early 1990s, Armstrong lived in a Los Angeles dormitory for the Cadet Org, the children of the Sea Org, Scientology's innermost core of devoted staff, former members told the Beast. So this particular building that is being talked about here is what's called the Anthony Building in Los Angeles, and I'll put up a photo of it. Her time in the Cadet Org is partially recounted in The Bad Cadet, a memoir by ex-Scientologist Catherine Spolino, who was raised in the church at the same time as Armstrong. Okay, so this is a Sea Organization flag order, 760, 25th May, 1968, Cadets, Children, Designation. I just want to draw your attention to this paragraph in the middle here. The word children is not to be used to describe these as it is a generality. If there are children about, they are classified as children, but this does not include cadets. Children are people who have not passed check sheets and have no paid posts in the Sea Org. See, there's that differentiation that I was talking about earlier. And that was written by Alwyn Hubbard. Spilino's memoir uses pseudonyms for the people she grew up with, but multiple former Scientologists who were raised at the same facilities and are aware of the details of the book told the Daily Beast that Ava in the book is Armstrong. In their elementary school years, Spilino and Armstrong were among the children housed in a four-story apartment complex called the Anthony Building, she said. Other former Scientologists have identified the building as a church property. So yes, it's true. The Anthony Building absolutely is a Scientology property. And this is where I first have memory of seeing Emily Armstrong or interacting with her. Uh, so she's a couple years younger than me. Children slept in three-tier bunk beds and cockroaches were everywhere in the bathroom, Spilino wrote. Zoe Woodcraft, another Scientologist who lived at the Anthony Building as a child in the 1990s, said that the carpets were old and smelly and there were a lot of cockroaches. There was no proper bedding. Not one of us had a complete sheet set, blanket and pillow, Woodcraft added. I slept without a pillow for many months. Zoe Woodcraft grew up in Scientology. So where'd you go then? So then I was like in the worst living conditions I think I've ever lived in, even worse than all this. I lived in something called the AB, the Anthony Building, uh, which is on Fountain Street, Fountain Avenue, Fountain Street mm -hmm. in, in LA. LA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's just like four stories of, of crap. <laughs> that's just, it's, uh, okay, they tore out the kitchen to make room for adults that were living in dorms with the children there. And they also like would live in the same rooms with us. 
Oh, also the dorms were really crowded. Uh, and we also had like three decker bunk beds and stuff like that to put in as much people as possible. How many people would be in a room? It would be like a small area, like a small little room. Um, and have like four or five girls living in there. And then they would have, because uh, say that was the bedroom, and then they'd have the living area, which we just thought was another room for beds. And that would have maybe like eight people in there. And then there was a tiny little kitchen area that had been ripped out, and that's where the adult was supposed to sleep. During the day, the kids at the LA dorm were taken several blocks away to the Apollo Training Academy, a Scientology run elementary school named after church founder Elrond Hubbard's original Sea Org ship. This is from a Scientology publication. And here it says, what is the Cadet Estates Organization? The Cadet Estates Org is the largest Sea Org child care organization on the planet. It services approximately 500 children. The Cadet Estates Org is located in Los Angeles, California. It consists of the child care center and the Sea Org school called the Apollo Training Academy. So at the time of this publication, the kids were housed at two separate locations. One was the CEO and the other location was this Apollo Training Academy, this ATA, which at the time of this document had the older kids. The younger kids were at the CEO. That's where I was. It says it's the child care. So that's where Emily was. That's where Catherine Spolino was. That's an official record of approximately 500 children were housed there. That is insane. Okay, and then the ATA, uh, that's where the older kids were. So this says that it trains children, cadets and young staff members who have not completed their legal schooling. The Sea Org School was established in June, 1986. It has evolved from 30 students to 300 in present time. Oh my, that's insane. So they're saying that there was 500 at one location and then 300 at another location. That's 800 children in Los Angeles who are in this child labor system. At the time of this article, which was 1988, is the date of this article, which it says here, an internal 1988 Scientology promotional flyer for the Cadet Org and the Apollo Training Academy. So I arrived at the CEO, which is the child care facility, in 1990. And I just remember there just being hundreds of children. There was just so many kids. The chaos was just, it was insane. Okay, premises. The Cadet Estates Org comprises three buildings. The Child Care Center, where children from one to five years of age were taken care of. The Sea Org School, where the cadets and children are educated. And the Cadet Org building, from which the cadets operate their own full seven division org. Okay, the Cadet Org. The Cadet Org is a separate entity from the Estates Org. It is an org formed up by cadets, which are children, under the command lines of Senior HCO, which is just a title position in the Sea Org. The Estates Org services the cadets and children, and it is responsible for their safety, well-being, and education. Children are put on standard check sheets from the time they are a few months old. Is that normal? Here they develop their abilities and grow up in a happy and safe environment where they learn to live as team members from age one. I told you this indoctrination starts early and you just saw it here. Children are put on standard check sheets from the time they are a few months old. Check sheets are like, it's like a, a training um, program. Okay. When they are six years old, they graduate to the ATA. So at the time of this publication, once they are six years old, they go to the ATA. And that is where they then do their training to be a cadet. They become a cadet there, and then they are then um, sent on to this, the inner core of the C organization. In school, they are educated to improve their survival in life. They learn to enjoy study and they get a good command of their basics before they are ready to join staff, which means that they learn how to read, write, some basic math, and then there'll be a Scientology studies in between there. And then, okay, you're now ready to be a C org member in within the core of the C org. At the cadet org, they get acquainted with the technology of administration. They learn to hold a post and to become true Sea Org members. So they learn how to hold a job in the Sea Org. Products. From December 1987 to present time, over 25 cadets have graduated and are now competent staff members in the different orgs in PAC. So PAC is the area of the blue buildings in Los Angeles. 
In 1974, LRH said, but what that needs is a big nursery children's org set up where the kids really get handled and go to school and are brought up right and resources are made there where no resources are now being made. You see, he was making resources. The children were resources. That's the language that we grew up around, like that we were a resource, that we had to be contributing members, that we were valuable assets. That was the language that we understood that we were property of the C organization and that was our sole purpose. The Cadet Estates Org has now made LRH's dream a reality. Sea Org children can now grow up as free and able beings in a safe environment where they are educated to become competent Sea Org members. Now you see how little these kids are? training to be Sea Org members. Okay, so back to this article and he's writing about Catherine Spolino's book, The Bad Cadet and the way that she describes it. Here she wrote, the children were trained in Scientology's paranoid ways, being made to write knowledge reports about one another that described bad behavior. They were also sent frequently to the Elrond Hubbard Life Exhibition, Scientology's peculiar Los Angeles museum dedicated to its founder, according to Spolino. Part of the exhibit she wrote involved them watching a movie about Dianetics, the name of the counseling system Hubbard developed that was rejected by doctors and scientists. Yes, so we were taken on buses and we would, as a group, be toured through the Alwyn Hubbard Life Exhibition frequently and repeatedly to the point where we could memorize it. Going through the Alwyn Hubbard Life Exhibition so many times where he was displayed as being like this God on earth type of thing. It really just built up this idea of Hubbard being this superhuman person. Lafayette Ronald Hubbard was born in 1911. He grew up in Montana. He was a student of life. In the South Pacific, he studied the most primitive civilizations with the most ancient knowledge. He learned that all minds respond identically to the same stimuli. In 1938, he wrote Excalibur, his first attempt to unify all knowledge and discover the meaning of existence. He healed himself with Scientology and he started healing other people too and teaching them about how to do it themselves. He wrote it all down in a book called Dianetics. How could a child question that? And this is what we were taught to believe. Because their Sea Org parents worked so much, the children were tended to in groups by a caretaker and most, Spolino said, only saw their moms on Saturday evening and Sunday morning. Several former members told the Los Angeles Times in 1990 that youngsters have gone for days without a visit from their parents who believe that their work for the group is transcendent. Now, um, it depends on what time period you're talking about. So that's true. Like at the time that uh, we were at the Anthony building and we were in those dormitories, the, dorm the main dormitories that we had were on the first floor. The parents had apartments um, on the floors above that. And we only spent time with our parents Saturday night and a Sunday morning was the main time you'd see them. But once we went to the ranch, we rarely saw our parents. Um, some people saw their parents, like their parents would visit them more frequently than others. I always only saw my mother like very, very infrequently because she was at the in base um, where she worked for Golden Era Productions and that's where she still works today. I would probably see her just like a handful of times a year. But once I went to the ranch, I probably saw her like more like three times a year. 
I, I, I reckon. My father would come up a little bit more frequently. Some parents made an effort to come up regularly. There was at some stage a bus that would go from Los Angeles to the ranch that would take the parents back and forth. They only have the Sunday morning off from their Sea Org duties. So they would, that drive up, I don't know, it was like an hour or so, an hour and a half maybe, um, just from memory. And so that would be included in their morning time off. So the travel there, spend an hour or two with the kids, then travel back. So some parents would make sure that they would get on that bus regularly and other parents wouldn't bother. And there was no monitoring of, you know, whose parents are coming and when was the last time some child saw their parents that wasn't sort of monitored or enforced. So, and you had no control over it. And there was one phone that you could use to contact your parents, which was down at the office. And I, and I know just for myself, like I never used that phone to call out to my parents. There was a couple of times when my parents called me. I do remember one phone call from my father. But yeah, apart from that, I think you know, we just didn't have that contact with our parents generally. And you just get to the point where you kind of forget that you have parents in a way because you're kind of living in this world where you're completely responsible for everything. So I guess you don't, you don't really feel like you need your parents to a degree. Yeah. And of course, then there's also kids that, you know, once they're working in the core of the Sea Org, um, no longer cadets, but having signed their billion year contracts, their visitation or their access to, to parents is depends on where their parents are and where they are. Some of the kids were sent to Florida while their parents remained in Los Angeles or vice versa or all parts of the world. So it just really um, depended on what org you were in or what your schedule was or whatever. So there's a lot of variation there. Stephen Kent, a sociologist at the University of Alberta in Canada, who has studied Scientology for four decades, told The Beast that the entire twofold purpose of removing children to remote locations in the cadet organization was to eliminate parents' child rearing time demands while at the same time providing Scientology the opportunity to groom the children and teens for eventual C organization recruitment. Wow, that is an incredible summary of absolute fact. That's pretty incredible. Okay. The removal of children from their parents, the requirement that the kids intensively study their leaders' teachings at the expense of normal educational material and their extreme regulation in often neglectful and abusive environments is regrettably typical of many cults. Now, I wanna make a distinction here because what I'm hoping to do is change some of the language around these types of groups because a cult can be a group that is not necessarily criminal, but Scientology is a criminal organization. If they're breaking the law, then they should be pursued and prosecuted for those crimes. And we do know that Scientology absolutely was in violation of child labor laws and a very, very long list of laws that they have broken in regards to the treatment and care of children. We need to see Scientology being prosecuted for these crimes against children. Okay, and so you can see this banner, of this section of the building is called the Skyway, and it's where you would travel from one building to another. So from the building called the Complex over to the building, which is the Asho building, um, there's a Skyway and it's this passageway that you can walk through. And you can see this long banner that says to join the Sea Org is the sensible thing to do. So that's what we were taught. That's the right choice is to join the Sea Org. Okay, and that picture is from 1992, which is a time period where Emily would have been around these blue buildings. The Church of Scientology said that it ceased providing childcare services to members of the Sea Org more than two decades ago, and that currently members of the Sea Org who wish to have children can resign. Okay, but there were still children in the Sea Org. They ceased with having a childcare facility, but they did not cease with housing and requiring children to work for them. There were parents at the time you refer to who chose to raise their children in the Sea Org, said a spokesperson. Some of those children became quite successful, even famous, a testament to the quality of their education and upbringing. Now, this is something that is a topic that the kids who grew up in this environment uh, have talked about because Scientology will automatically take credit for any of your success. But the fact is that we became successful or pursued the things in life that we wanted to do in spite of the education and upbringing that we had. Um, and it's 
no testament to that. It's a testament to our strength and resilience. It is not a credit to Scientology. Home on the Pack Ranch. Spolino's memories of Armstrong become much stronger later in their youth when they were moved to the Canyon Oaks Ranch or Pack Ranch, a former Sea Org run boarding school in Santa Clarita, northwest of Los Angeles. Armstrong, or Ava, she says, arrived aged 11, and Spolino was shocked to learn she was yet to make rank in the cadet org. I guess I don't really want to be a cadet, she recalled the young Armstrong saying. I guess I just want to play guitar. Spolino suggested she join the Sea Org's in-house band. Okay, so that's in reference to the Jive Aces, which is the Sea Org band. But Armstrong seemed more keen on skateboarding. I bet once Ava studied Elwyn Hubbard's policy, she would change her mind, she added. However, Armstrong did go on to be a cadet. A copy of a 1999 issue of the Cadet Times, a newsletter for ranch cadets, contains a photo of Armstrong among children who completed their educational requirements and graduated to a cadet by that year when she turned 13. This is the Pack Cadet Org, explosive expansion. Okay, so we have Emily Armstrong is pictured there as a cadet. And this says underneath the photo, it says, above children who have now completed their educational requirements and have graduated to a cadet which means that she didn't want to be a cadet but she had to because we all had to this was not an environment of choices okay the canyon oaks cadet chapter was known as the pack ranch cadet org because the children were bused to scientology's pacific area command pack base in los angeles to do work former Scientologists, including Spolino, have said. Spolino wrote that a job there was called a mission. So this is something that we would frequently go and do. Even at the ATA, which is just down the street from this building, um, we were brought over to this main Sea Org area to do missions. And I can recall doing that from as early as eight years old. A lot of it was like filing paperwork or promotional materials. Later on, I was taken to the pack base or where the blue buildings are um, to do renovations. I was at 13 years old. I was renovating one of the levels of the AOLA building. I think it was on the third floor. Yeah. Sina Kamola, a former Scientologist who appeared on Leah Remini's docu-show Scientology in the Aftermath in 2017, alleged that in the mid-1990s, not long before Armstrong was there, she was made to work 60 hours for $50 a week. Now, what Sina is actually talking about, 60 hours for $50 a week, the $50 a week, that's the paycheck of the Sea Org. Yeah, so two things, because Sina was also at the Pack Ranch Cadet Org, but she would have gotten $15 a week at the Pack Ranch Cadet Org, but when she got into the Sea Org, she was then would have then started to be paid $50 a week. Okay. The church told the Beast that the public accounts of former Scientologists were based on false assumptions, inaccurate and misleading information, or outright false reports. One task at the ranch was to plant an apple orchard at the ranch, Spolino wrote. The children were made to dig trenches into the night illuminated by the headlights of a parked truck, she said, and she wanted to complain, but didn't want to seem like a whiner. Because that's absolutely something you're not supposed to do. An undated photo posted in a social media group of former cadets shows Armstrong and other children standing in front of the orchard. And I have another photo of that as well. So yes, this is Emily Armstrong uh, standing in front of the apple orchard that they were made to plant at all hours of the day and night. Okay. Cadets were also allegedly subject to grotesque punishments. Kamula said the school principal at the ranch once forced several minors to eat lunch in a maggot-infested dumpster after claiming they were too messy. Spolino recalls a similar incident where children were made to eat next to a dumpster full of rotten food and then clean it. And this is a photo of that dumpster at the ranch location here. In a statement, Scientology called Remini's series a hate-filled propaganda TV show, claiming it was rife with many false representations about the church. After Remini's show aired in 2017, Scientology set up a website to counter the claims made by former members about the cadet org. One of those on the website was Adeline Armstrong, Emily's older sister. So 
Adeline also obviously grew up with us. Scientology had a bunch of these people that are still Scientologists um, do these videos to deny the abuse that myself and Sina talked about in the Leah Remini Scientology in the Aftermath show. And they were propped up to deny that any of this ever happened, which again is why I feel like there is a responsibility for people to stand up and say, no, this did happen. This did happen, I was there. Okay, so Adeline said in this video, I have some of the fondest memories of just cracking open a watermelon that we grew and sitting on a railroad tie and eating the big old watermelon, she said in one video. It was fun. Adeline did not respond to a request for comment. Of course not. Mother in high places. There is no indication that Armstrong joined the Sea Org, but her mother, Gail, has held several prominent posts at the Office of Special Affairs, the Sea Org's most powerful arm. There is no indication that Armstrong joined the Sea Org, but her mother, Gail, has held several prominent posts at the Office of Special Affairs, the Sea Org's most powerful arm. It was described by former Scientologist and actor Carmen Llewellyn in 2015 as a sophisticated intelligence agency and a complex system dedicated to ruining the lives of those it sees as enemies in any way possible. OSA has been involved in organizing campaigns against ex-members. Gail Armstrong took part in one against Mike Rinder, the former church executive who turned whistleblower in 2015 and later co-starred in Remini's documentary. In a video on a site, Scientology set up explicitly to discredit him. Gail accused Rinder of having a very demeaning attitude towards women. Gail's appearance in the video was after years working for Scientology propaganda efforts. In 1991, acting as the president of the Church of Scientology California, she contacted the FBI in a failed effort to ask the agency to include official Scientology leaflets in responses to freedom of information requests about the church, claiming it would combat the FBI files misleading and erroneous information about Scientology. So this is like combating false data in Scientology. So that what they wanted to do is put in like the quote, the correct information about Scientology's good acts. Um, this is a letter that she wrote, Gail Armstrong. She was listed on the masthead of OSA published newsletter Scientology Today in 1994, then promoted in the late 1990s to lead Scientology's in-house investigative magazine Freedom as executive director. It was there that she helped spread the organization's most brazen assertions about psychiatry, which it has long attacked because medical experts dismissed Hubbard's 1950 work Dianetics, the modern science of mental health for its lack of empirical basis. In volume 31, issue two of Freedom, released in September 1999, an article by two authors partly blamed the 1998 Columbine massacre on one of the perpetrators, Eric Harris, taking an antidepressant. The piece goes on to attribute other violence and murder committed by adolescents to Ritalin, Dextrogen, and Prozac. In the same edition, Gail, the executive editor, herself laid blame for school shootings partly on psychological conditioning as well as medical professionals diagnosing children with conditions like ADHD. In an issue of Freedom, Gail edited after the 2001 World Trade Center attacks, the main feature claimed that Osama bin Laden had been goaded into 9-11 by his deputy doctor-turned-terrorist Ayman al-Zawahiri using unknown psychiatric methods and claimed without evidence that al-Zawahiri was secretly a psychiatrist. In a statement about psychiatry, Scientology touted its support for its own anti-psychiatry nonprofit, the Citizens Commission on Human Rights, and among other things, flagged a 2021 apology by the American Psychiatric Association for Structural Racism. In a September interview, Rinder, who once led OSA, said Gail held multiple other roles at the church, including public relations work and writing speeches for leadership in the 2000s. News articles show her acting as a church spokesperson as early as 1997 and as late as 2008. Rinder also alleged that in 2006 or 2007, Gail was thrown in the hole, a detention building where Scientologists have been allegedly held after church leader Miscavige found their performance or behavior wanting. In a statement, the church called Rinder a degenerate and an inveterate liar and said Gail is a very intelligent and competent woman. While her mother was a high profile part of the church, Armstrong was relatively low key while pursuing a rock career as front woman of Dead Sarah. But in September 2020, she publicly supported that 70s show star Danny Masterson, a Scientologist, at his trial where he was accused of raping three women. 
He was convicted of raping two of the women and sentenced to 30 years in prison. The third case ended in a hung jury. Chrissy Carnell Bixler, the former church member whose case ended in the hung jury, alleged on the day after Armstrong was unveiled as the Lincoln Park singer that she came to the trial as a hardcore Scientologist and was part of a group intended to intimidate one of the two unnamed victims. Her husband, Mars Volta singer and ex-Scientologist Cedric Bixler Zavala, echoed the allegations. And here they are pictured together. And this is at the Celebrity Center. It looks like it's the gala, which is a big fancy event that's held at the Celebrity Center every year. Okay. Later that day, after a hail of media coverage about the claims, Armstrong said in an Instagram story that she misjudged Masterson, should not have attended the hearing, and stopped speaking with him afterwards. I do not condone abuse or violence against women, and I empathize with the victims of these crimes, she added. And this is from her post on Instagram. She did not mention Scientology or address the allegation that she attended the hearing as part of a Scientology-related campaign. The church said it was not a party to Masterson's criminal trial and that those who attended were exercising their right to be a part of a public hearing, not as part of an organized effort. Scientology also called Bixler's claim unhinged and said they are part of an attempted money grab in a civil suit. Carnell Bixler, her husband, and Masterson's two other alleged victims are suing him and the church for damages. She claims to have faced retaliation for speaking out against him. Scientology strenuously denies the claims and said the Bixlers have never produced a shred of evidence to support their campaign of hate against the church. The Bixlers did not respond to requests for comments. Now, their civil suit is set to continue on from September of next year, 2025. Currently, the court has allowed time for Danny Masterson to pursue any possibilities for appeal. And once that time is exhausted, this civil suit will continue on. And we are going to see a lot of information about how the organization was involved in the cover-up, how the organization was involved in the harassment of these victims and the silencing of these victims. We did see a lot of it come out in the Danny Masterson trial, but there was a lot that was not allowed to be included in that for the purpose of prosecuting Danny Masterson for criminal charges. But the civil suit focuses on the organization's involvement. So there is just gonna be so much information for everybody to find out about the lengths that this organization will go to to cover up these types of crimes. So we'll wait until then to learn more about what happened. But we do know that Scientology does organize its members for specific purposes. And this is a known tactic to use people's friends and associates in order to intimidate them. Okay. Wall of Secrets. It is unclear if Armstrong remains a member of the church. Lincoln Park's management and record label both failed to respond to requests for comment on whether Armstrong remains a Scientologist and on her past in the church. The Church of Scientology declined to state whether she is a member, citing privacy concerns. She could be the target of retaliation, Tony Ortega, a journalist who has covered Scientology for two decades, said. She knows that if she were to speak out, she'd never see her mother again, so that's a big threat. If she speaks out publicly, yes, she could lose her family members, and a ton of friends, and I understand that. For everyone who is out and speaking out about these things, we've all experienced that. We've all experienced disconnection, but you have to understand that that's the thing that Scientology holds over people to keep them silent about crimes. This is a criminal organization that operates a fear machine, and this is part of it making people afraid to speak but at the same time what are you risking by staying silent if she does remain a scientologist he said its celebrity members are trained how to conduct publicity while avoiding any negative associations with scientology they've been conditioned for so many years the most they will say is it's been helpful in my life you should read a book he said it would be unusual for her to say anything they can't imagine themselves being candid it's not even in the realm of possibility for them Linkin Park's first album with Armstrong as lead vocalist from Zero released Friday may contain a hint about her membership on the lead single she says I only wanted to be part of something well the truth is that Emily Armstrong was a part of something. And I know that I don't have the influence to compel her to speak out on these things. That's a decision that she is going to have to make 
for herself. I am going to speak on these things because I have a voice. No more silence about the abuse of children in Scientology, past or present. Thank you all for taking the time to watch this video. This is Rage Against the Dark Arts.